This building, the fruit and vegetable market in Southern Town. We recently had our, well, reasonably recently had a great big facelift inside there. Now, before we just go on to that, I'll just give you one, one or two things. By the usual, uh, if you put your mobile phones on silent, please, uh, in the event of a fire, straight out the door you came in, up the steps and away to the left, or out this door to our right and follow me. I'll be running, yeah, I'll be breaking the land speed record out there. If Anne does beat me out to the exit in the okay? And, uh, and if I could just mention, there's a donations box at the back of the hall for anybody uh, as, they, as they leave tonight. Uh, uh, I'm sure you're going to really enjoy this lecture. But in the meantime, we also have, we started a little list at the back of the hall. And basically, it's in relation to um, our, our project, our, our play, which is currently uh, been uh, being got ready for the 24th, 25th and 26th of March next year. The play which re revolves around the writings of Norse Elizabeth O'Farrell. I've mentioned it on several occasions before. Yeah. So in order that we might be able to fund it, we're engaging a little bit of uh, crowdfunding or group funding, so to speak. So in other words, our tickets are extremely limited for the six performances of this play that will be in the Rural Red Theatre in March of next year. And in order to ensure that you get a ticket, in other words, you can make not a down payment, not a deposit, you can make a donation at the, uh, to us at a later stage, which will guarantee uh, your accessibility to tickets on that, uh, for that particular show. So it's quite a common practice among many societies and many community groups throughout Ireland it's something that's increasingly becoming more popular, and I'll mention it again. So if you want to start it tonight, just by putting down your name and contact number that you're possibly interested in this idea, we'd greatly appreciate uh, your, your, your interest and your feedback on that subject. So in the meantime, just leave you this one for John. You heard about the cabbage that died and passed away there recently? And a big torn up at the funeral. <laughs> okay. So before I give away the rest of John's jokes, okay, the only one tonight, without further ado, John Conroy. Well, now that joke certainly puts it up to me, doesn't it? <laughs> I can guarantee you there's no jokes tonight. <laughs> um, I hope... Um, I want, want to first of all thank you all for coming along and taking an interest in this because it's been a hobby of mine from the last number of years. I don't, I can't remember how many years, but it's uh, probably about seven or eight years. Um, I came across the market, well I mean I've always known about it, but seriously came across the market as part of a project I was involved in called Designing Dublin, and I won't go too much into that, but as part of it we had to do a project, and I used to ramble through it every day, and talking to people and rooting around, I found there's nothing written about this market, which is such an important part of our history, whether we like it or not, because when you think of it, it fed this country, and you know, it, it depends on the way you look at it, but the food went in and out of this that fed the country, uh, not just Dublin, and it's down through the years was very, very um, important in that sense, and it's also a very innovative building that I'll go into with you. I presume you can all hear me, can you? Yeah. 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 I just don't want to get tied behind. Oh, something about to happen there. Is it? Ah, there we are. Um, one of, one of the things that always interested me or that attracted me to it was the forklifts that fly around <coughs> inside and outside. And I'm told there's no records of accidents around them. Now, I'm sure that's not totally true, but that's what they, they all swear around. That they are in the scouts, right? <laughs> now, what I want to look at, or what I have been looking at, and I'm going to just fly through this as much so as not to bore you, is why the market was built originally by Dublin Corporation. And I'm fascinated as an ex-employee of Dublin Corporation at how quick it was done from uh, the time discussion to implementation. I've also looked at trying to track its journey through the council 
until it was opened. I also had a look in a small way at how it functioned and interacted with different communities as far away as Rush in North County Dublin. Uh, and Ballymount on this side of the city and I'm sure other areas as well. The families that walk there and did walk there, I mean there's families that have been there, um, not, not the individuals but the families from the day it opened and to me that there's that connection is fascinating. Um, the building itself is interesting and it's a very innovative building, reflecting an era before electricity or refrigeration. Uh, as most of you know, uh, electricity wasn't used in widely in Dublin until the early 20th century. I also looked at a few of the suppliers, uh, the farmers, market gardeners, and in a sense to show how circumstances outside their control affected um, business and their profits. In a lot of cases the women employed inside, outside it and on the farms were women. Uh, and this tended to mirror the court culture in the early markets. Um, and a large proportion of the small traders uh, were within and outside were women. And I also want to look at the early custom or the custom in latter years of optioning the four strawberries of the year. Now, if anybody has any information on that, I'm open to getting, I've only a small amount of information on that. Sourcing the material for this was very, very difficult. As I said, there was very little written on the market. And also, the date it opened wasn't widely known. As well as that, there are so many different addresses attached to the market. The latest being Smithfield. I mean, funny with somebody. <laughs> and it has been advertised by the corporation as being in Smithfield. And that has caused so many problems, both of the traders. And I know when I was giving talks there during open house, people turning up two or three hours after the intended and missing a whole lot of other stuff. Yeah. Because, but there's an obsession within the council of creating a Smithfield area. But I mean, it's just an unnatural area with Church Street going up the middle. It's just not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> once I found that it opened in 1892. I went straight into council minutes and that led me into reports and I was able to walk from there. But that was the key for me, just finding that date. Um, yet, last but not least of, of this part of it, um, some of the characters that walk there. Characters are a very important part of Dublin, as we all know, and I'm sure all the rest of the country. But we all grew up with characters, and sometimes their misfortunes tended to, to define them in their memory. But there's a more serious side to these characters, in that some of them suffered debilitating accidents, but needed to earn extra money to support families, or in a lot of cases, a drink habit. Underlying these people is the struggle to stave off poverty, which was right across Dublin, particularly in the markets areas, but in the markets they were afforded a place where they could try and uh, earn a living uh, and it enabled this. Now where it began, Dublin Corporation, I'm sure quite a lot of you know this, came into being in the late uh, 13th century and it was a two chamber body at that time. Under the Municipal Reform Act of 1840, a process of modernisation was put in place that showed the functioning of the Dublin Liberties, even the two largest, which were already struggling to keep pace with the demands made by an increasingly complex urban society, was proved to be demonstrably inadequate for purpose. The law implemented many important reforms that were needed to improve the operations and accountability of local government. 
one of the most significant of these was to greatly increase the number of people who could vote in uh, city elections. And many important developments occurred in the city after this date, including uh, the building of the fruit and vegetable market. The first mention that I was able to find of markets went back to 1852, when Dublin Corporation had a report on all markets in the city, of which there was an enormous amount. It mentions that a royal commission, which that year held a sitting in Halston Street, reported that although in the year 1849, the corporation had obtained powers to establish markets that nothing had been done, and that great dissatisfaction existed, but that vested interest and established usages proved too strong for the corporation, and in a way, they still have that problem in trying to and modernised the, the market itself. And a great evil existed. This was, in, this was in the report that was handed to the Lord Mayor Joseph M. Mead on the opening of the market on the 6th of December uh, 1892. And I should mention that at that stage it was known as the fish and vegetable market. It mentions that the conditions of the markets was, but nothing was done to remedy this evil from the period down to the year 1883, when the markets committee, under the chairmanship of uh, councillor James Macdonald, took the matter in hands. It then lays out the various steps taken between 83 and 1890. <coughs> and also there's mention of the markets construction committee which was formed by a resolution of the corporation in the 14th of January, 1889. They held 116 meetings. Some of the motivation for the corporation building the market um, was revenue as much as the conditions in the city. And that's shown in the following quote. The conditions in which the wholesale food markets have been allowed for so long a time to remain has been frequently described. It is sufficient now to say that we're all unsatisfactory, some of them wholly unsuited, a disgrace to the city. Beside the discredit and disadvantage to the city of having the markets in this condition, the revenue derivable from these markets were in the hands of private individuals. In the case of the vegetables, the sales were to a great extent carried on the streets and no contribution of any kind was made by the growers who all resided outside the city boundary, other vendors, other dealers, to the revenue of the city. So the building of this had two purposes. One was to try and deal with the poverty and the disease on the streets and also to bring in money. And one of the reasons the corporation was suffering a loss of revenue was the creation of the new towns of Ratmines, Terenmuir and Pembroke on one side of the city and Clontarf and Drumcondra on the other. Vegetables were sold on the street, but I've just already gone into that. Now, to build it, they had to take out mortgages or loans that were turned into mortgages. And these were uh, taken from the commissioners of public works. And there were various sums of 45,000, 20,000, and 5,000 over a period from 1989, no, sorry, that's wrong, 1889 to uh, May 1891. And it was agreed to pay these sums back at uh, an interest rate of one pound and threepence per hundred pounds. Some of the correspondence between the markets committee and the main body of the council are revealing in that they show how business is formally conducted between um, uh, between the two, how, how the business was formally conducted between the two bodies. The letter showed that these transactions went through council at that time. Now, the way it shows it, I'm sure it's quite similar to the way things are done now. Uh, not a lot other than maybe a little bit of language has changed. Each sum is submitted to the council for approval, then passed on to the law agent, 
who prepares the documentation for signature. Uh, this was repaired each time as a mortgage on the property was taken and was guaranteed by the council. The site itself had to be cleared and this was done in 1889. All of the houses on the south side of Marley's Lane from Boot Lane to Bull Lane were removed. The markets were built on the site of a half drawn houses and were constructed of brick and limestone. The purchase was negotiated by a civil engineer called a Mr. Arthur Dudgeon, D-U-D-G-E-O-N. But before undertaking this job, he gave an estimate of the costs to the corporation of £43,500. The total cost when it was done of the land, all the interests, including, including trade interests, amounted to forty-five thousand four hundred and seven pounds fourteen and truppence. <laughs> <laughs> the land comprising over three acres included uh, where eventually the fish market was built some years later. Uh, if any of you don't know where that it's actually beside the market on this side and it's now a car park, you know. So basically, the old fish market was just raised to the ground. But it wasn't, in my memory, it wasn't anything as interesting as this building is, you know? Um, yeah, also, what I found interesting here was that part of the land that this was built on was where the old prison was in Green Street, the Newgate Prison, the newer Newgate Prison, if you know what I mean. And uh, so it shows you just how big that prison itself was. The negotiations were numerous and complicated, but such care was exercised by the law agent, Mr. McSheehy, and by Mr. Dudgeon in asserting these claims and in their adjustments that only one case ultimately was submitted to a jury. In this case, case the amount awarded by the public arbitrator was substantially reduced to the benefit of the corporation. Now, needless to say, they were happy people. The Irish builder, in August 1892, around three months before it was officially opened, uh, described the market in this manner. In the course of time, we will venture to say, will rank foremost with many of our modern buildings. They stand upon an area which has been one of the most congested districts. All the houses were taken down on the south side of Mary's Lane, from the corner of Boot Lane to Bull Lane, all Fisher's Lane and Bull Lane, and about half a dozen houses in Boot Lane, which is now Arran Street, as far as the old Boot Inn, from which the street took its name. The new fish and vegetable markets are situated in Mary's Lane and St. Micken Street, the latter was formerly uh, Fisher's Lane. Having an elevation on both these thoroughfares, the genital style and treatment may be classed as Romanesque. <coughs> the elevation um, in Mary's Lane shows a central gateway flanked with detached Corinthian lime columns of limestone, it says. I'm not sure whether there's a limestone, or that's a misprint. Uh, from Ballinasloe Quarry. Having size entrances um, for pedestrians, you'll see them here and you'll just see them over there. Um, the tympanums over the arches are faces, faced with terracotta diaper in squares of 18 inches, which is treated in a very bold manner with conventional uh, foliage. Uh, just let me show you that. You'll see there the fish on one side and the... Now they're not like that, that was me taking dodgy photographs. Um, Are they upside down? <laughs> no, well, they, they, it, it, it was hard to get them in. They, they probably get torn the other way. But when you're messing around, as I am, with technology that I don't fully understand, that was the best I could do. Um, now, there's, it also mentions uh, the city shield. As you can see there, that was um, the only picture I could find going back to, of that. I tried to take photographs of it myself, but 
with all the activity around that was nearly knocked down. I was going to be that accident with the hog lifts. Um, the iron walk, um, iron walk as well as its wooden features are described in great detail in, in this as you would expect from a building publication. It also describes the innovative roofing which I'm going to speak about later on. It also refers to markets when talking about the fish and vegetable market when they were in the same building. And that might suggest, which, the way it's been spoken about suggests to me that they quite possibly worked as separate units within the same building, which made the transition just that bit easier. Um, Christine Casey, in her book about the buildings of Dublin, describes the market with its addresses, Mary's Lane, in this manner. 1892, designed by Park Neville in 1886, and executed by Spencer Harty, his successor as city engineer. A large covered market composed of eight gabled E to W ranges of iron and glass, encased within an arcaded perimeter wall of red and yellow brick. The formal elaborate Corinthian entrances on Meredith Lane North and Orange Street West. The structural ironwork, which you'll see here, is supplied by J. Lloyd of Bristol and the decorative iron tympana by McLaughlin and Son. Delightfully freely modelled terracotta labelled stoops of fish, fruit and vegetables supplied by Henry Dennis of Rubon, <coughs> which is a county borough in Wrexham in Wales, though the template has been attributed to C.W. Harrison. Uh, the, the, um, she also goes back to mention the, the figure of justice and fair trade over the Mary's Lane entrance of Abbey Harrison. Um, across the street, a contemporary brick fish market of similar design without the ornaments. And I found <coughs> it just interesting. She uses a different spelling of the McLaughlin den in most, in most other um, pieces of writing that I've come across, like whether it's minutes or council. She spells it M C G L O U G, where the G is missing everywhere else. So I don't know whether she knows something that I don't or that the council don't. But going back to the beginning, it, there's no G in the spelling. Now, there is a market handout available in the market, but I found that other than confirming um, who opened it, the Lord Mayor, and who designed it, and all of that type of stuff, it's basically an advertisement for the place, and it's uh, encouraging people to come in and, and hit this. Now, sorry about that. Now, the tendering process for it. The advertisement was placed in the contract journal and the Dublin papers on the 28th of October 1890, looking for contractors to tender for the work. The Markets Committee of the Corporation in Dublin avoid tenders for the erection of the new fish and vegetable market in Mary's Lane and Fisher's Lane. The tender was divided into two contracts, but contractors could tender could tender for the building works and the early works together, but the amount of each must be stated separately. <coughs> there were 12 tenders received, and if you actually look at these, you will see that the tender from Messrs. H. and J. Martins of £19,883, two anointments, when you put the two tenders together, was actually the cheapest. But if you break the companies and separate them, as they did with um, Messrs. Conley and Sons for Contract 1 and John Loyser for Contract 2, the combined total came to £19,059, a saving of £824, two anointments. Spencer Harty wrote to the committee, recommended that they take these two together rather than the H&J Martin tender and this was recommended to the full council and accepted. Uh, when the council accepted this they found that a further mortgage of 20,000 was needed. 
But I found a letter in amongst all the minutes and stuff from a Mr. W. B. K. K. E. A. M. of H. and J. Martins, dated the 1st of December 1890. And he notes that he's aware that his company, their estimate is the lowest, and that a question has been raised as to their use of Irish materials. He tries to negate this perception by maintaining the company would use Irish materials where possible. Now, I found no mentions in any of the tender material uh, stating that Irish materials had to be used. But an interesting thing is that when you look through the accounts of the council, from the, going back to the beginning of this and further back, they do always separate Irish materials and the cost of them from foreign materials. So maybe somewhere in the background this was a thing, or else maybe a council had just sold this to H and J Martin or W uh, to H and J Martin as an excuse because it wouldn't have been unusual for councillors to be very closely aligned with big business, as most of them were big businessmen anyway themselves. So it's quite possible that the confidentiality of council was um, ignored, as it still is often nowadays, you know. Um, the market was eventually built at a cost of 14700 by contractor W. Connolly and Sons, and the iron roof was supplied and fitted by J. Lysett from Bristol at a cost of 4359 and as you can see there, uh, I know there's some of you over there, the name is on all of the pillars of uh, Lysitz. And I just have suggested to the corporation that they actually pick that out of the pillars, but it's too much work for them, you know. Uh, it's, it's actually very, it's just interesting, I find. But another interesting part about um, J. Lysitz is they are the same company that were involved in the older Covent Gardens market in London in 1830. So there's a connection between the original Covent Garden and the era market here. And for those that are interested, the clerk of works on this was a guy called Charles O'Toole. Now, um, I spoke to you about the roof, and I, f I find this interesting. And this was very, very innovative in that it's called uh, either um, a sawtooth roof system, which you can see up and down, or the shed principle. And how it works is that, you see the light there comes in in the morning, bearing in mind this was before electricity, and the um, guys would be in here from 3 o'clock in the morning, so they'd be waiting for the sun to come up to give them a bit of light, and on the other side then, you have tiling, which kept out heat during the day. And if you walk through that market even today, you, you get a shiver. Now the guys who are hauling stuff around one, but you'll see from this, they now have electricity in it and refrigeration. Uh, so they're trying to do something uh, with how cold it was. But in those days, uh, vegetables went off very, very quickly. The coldness was very, very uh, important. Uh, the market, as I said, you're getting a shiver now with me talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking in it. It's absolutely freezing in it. Uh, the market, one of the problems for me was the lots of different addresses. Um, there was Micken Street, Arden Street, Mary's Lane, Fisher's Lane, all of these. And down through the years, you come across these. You will also come across the fish market, the fruit and vegetable market, and the food market, plus uh, the fact that it's in Smithfield, you know. So all, all of those things had to be gone through. The market <laughs> is referred to in a companion's guide to Dublin by Jerry Williams in Jeremy Williams in 1994 as follows. It has so far eluded demolition and still invigorates the surrounding city. Elegant functional sheds screened by characterful facades 
that unite the monumental with the light-hearted, enter through limestone triumphal arches surmounted by sculptural groups, the work of Charles Harrison. These in turn are linked by arcades filled with variegated brickwork and wrought iron grills. The facades are adorned with decorative terracotta tiling and pendants depicting the wares being sold inside. The last echo of Woodward's sculptural program for the TCD Museum building of 30 years before. The market was executed in 1889-92 by Spencer Harty following the 1884 designs of Paul Merrill who died in 1886. Now the reason I mention this is this is the only publication that mentions Paul Merrill. Everything else says the designs were originally done by Park Neville. So I'm not quite sure what the contradiction, but I just think it's worth noting that there is um, a suggestion that it could be somebody else. The superintendent is very important in the market. And he was a, uh, an advertisement was placed in the morning papers of the 7th of October. 1892. The Municipal Council of the City in Dublin will upon Monday the 7th of November 1892 proceed to elect a fit and proper person to be superintendent of the fish and vegetable markets and a collector of stallage, rents and tolls of said market at a salary of £150 a year with residents. The person elected will be required to enter into security to the satisfaction of the committee in the sum of £100, age not to exceed 40 at last 30. Applications with copies of testimonials to be lodged with the town clerk at or before 5 o'clock on Monday the 7th of October. It's, I, I won't go any more into that, right? 49 applications were received and 38 candidates appeared before the committee and the committee then just uh, shortlisted down to 10 applicants. Uh, at this stage the committee set out a memorandum of duties for the superintendent which uh, was confirmed by the council and it included seeing bylaws are duly observed he shall reside on the premises be in his office prior to the hours fixed for the commencement of business the late toll and lodge same in the Bank of Ireland, not later than the following Monday after collection. This memorandum also raised the security from £100 to £200 and was signed off. And when you want to be think of it, to have £200 to apply for a job, when the job was paying 150 a year, despite the, the residents, you have to have means or access to means. So, you know, people in poverty couldn't have applied for that job. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad reflection of the time, but I suppose it's one of those things. Uh, the memorandum then was altered and an amendment was put forward by Councillor Mayne and seconded by Councillor James MacDonald that the superintendent shall collect all tolls, stallages and rents each day and lodge same upon receivable order in the Bank of Ireland daily and that with this alteration the recommendation contained in the letter, letter, in the letter of the Marcus Committee be adopted and it was carried. And it's also interesting to note that the Bank of Ireland is still the main bank of Dublin Corporation. Um, they then read, went through all of the different um, advertisements that were in the different papers and had a look at them. They then reduced the numbers down to three. And there was a Mr. Green with 21 votes, a Mr. O'Connell for Simon with 20, and a Mr. Dennis Doyle with 14 votes. And another ballot was held. Mr. Green received 29 votes and Mr. O'Connell received 24. So Mr. Breen was the fourth superintendent of the market. In the first round of votes, Mr. Breen had received five votes, and Mr. O'Connell had received eight. So in subsequent things, that overturned. Now, how the market functioned. The market is situated adjacent to the chicken fish and clothes market, which we all know is the daisy market and gave the trader some protection from biting winds and heavy rains. 
Inside the clang of the auction bell sounded in vain over the sound of haggling and hard bargaining. In Barry Kennock's book, uh, titled Moor Street, Justin Leonard describes the scene as told to him by his grandmother, who was the first woman to have a stall there after it opened. The market opened at 7 o'clock, and this would be his memory, but there's evidence it was actually open at 5 o'clock, and I'll come to that in a minute. <coughs> The first hour from 7 to 8 was for growers to bring their produce in. The bulk of not all of the vegetables came from North County Dublin by horse and cart. Growers didn't come from further field as it wouldn't have reached the market quick enough. Some vegetables came from Eden and Wexford. The farmers would pull up with a horse and cart at the top of the market and you can see here there was a queue system used. Now this is the type of horse and cart that was used and you would see the cabbage on the back, but they would be actually packed up much more than that. And there was usually a pyramid shape to the cabbage, and it was quite a skillful thing to do. But this just a later version of the same cube, but you can imagine that with horse and carrots. Uh, I just haven't been able to find a picture of the cube with it, but in time, I'm sure I will. Uh, each grower supplied a particular company, when the carts came up, they would pull up side what were called banks. And if you're in the market, you would see there's a raised, it's like a small roadway and a raised path on both sides, about six inches. And the pathways are called banks, and they still are. Now, I had a look at them, I measured them from what some of the traders told me was the area. And you can see from uh, steel girders or stanchions that have been cut back. And they measure 7 foot wide by 11 foot from back to front. Now it's quite possible, and I'm sure it's true, that some of the wholesalers purchase more than one bank as they do nowadays. And in actual fact, some of the stuff that I'll come to will show you that that was probably the case. Um, there was no packaging in those days. There was no boxes of bags. Everything on the cart was packed loose, and this was an art in itself. <laughs> the doors were open to let the buyers in, and the auctioneers would start the bidding off. Whoever gave the biggest price would get the cart or the cabbage or whatever the produce was. And the first one of the day set the price for the rest of the day. Anyone could be an auctioneer, but you have to join the association. Every year the four strawberries were auctioned for anything up to three pounds of strawberry with the proceeds going to a reputable charity. They were usually bought by one of the top hotels like the Gresham or the Shelbourne. A picture alongside the seller, the auctioneer and some dignitaries would receive publicity in the major papers. This was also good publicity for the market. I came across an article in the Irish Press from 80, 1983, which showed the difference from the very beginning when it was three pounds of strawberry to um, the bidding war that happened in um, 1983. And the strawberries were sold for the sum of 52 pounds each for a strawberry. <laughs> that is some Celtic tiger <laughs> back in 83. Right? <laughs> And uh, the half pound punnet was sold for a record £520. The strawberries were grown in Dunboyne by Elaine Coughlin and were purchased by the successful bidder, Fruitier Kinnahans uh, of Westmoreland Street in a furious bid war that was conducted at the stand of Walter L. Cole. The auctioneer was Connor Hickey, who opened the bid for £50. The woman who bid on behalf of Kinnahan's was absolutely delighted and told the newspaper reporter that it's a fitting reopening of our store in Westmoreland Street. The previous record for strawberries at that stage was £500 for a £1 punnet. The strawberries were donated to the Clontarf Rehabilitation Centre. Uh, normally the money is donated to a charity but in this case it was used for a different purpose. The method for growing these particular strawberries was a technique called hydrophonics where the plants are in the solution from runner to maturity and never touch earth or peat moss. 
they took 69 days to grow instead of the whole winter as had been previous. Um, the money will go towards perfecting it, said Mrs. Coppin. And it's just interesting to know, I mean, I'm not quite sure what good the strawberries were to um, the uh, rehabilitation centre, but it probably got them a lot of publicity as well and encouraged people to maybe donate money or, or whatever. Just uh, have a picture here. Uh, this guy is called Tommy Bremen, and you would see in his hands there. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I haven't been able to find what year this is. I tried to contact them, but I haven't been successful. But I found this um, picture in the market, and I spent a lot of money in having it, you know, um, brought back to a reasonable standard. It, the, the original is in an awful state, you know. Um, looking at the balance sheets of the council, or of the corporation, it's obvious the food market was a revenue generator for Dublin Corporation, bringing in £2,480 of four shillings in the six month period up to March 1914. Its expenses for the same period were £982, two shillings and ten pence. The revenue stream for the period was slightly above half the estimate for the year, while the expenditure was well below half. And um, I just picked 1914 because every year it showed a substantial um, benefit to the corporation. So I just blindly just opened the page and took that. And that's why 1914 is there rather than giving you every year. Um, in the report of the Markets Committee, it tells us the North of Ireland Produce Company was granted a space of 43 square yards at the weekly rent of 28 shillings and sixpence, and the committee agreed to provide an office for the firm at a cost of about £35, but this item was not provided for in the estimates. But it does show you that they were selling more than just one bank. Um, the Electricity Supply Committee was requested to have the electric light fitting in the market overhauled. The committee appointed James Bourne temporarily as a market porter at one pound two shillings a week and subsequently having complied with the corporation regulations was permanently appointed as a porter. Messrs Maher and Company um, badly are in need of an office and the committee decided to build one for them and again was not provided for the estimates. But the um, electricity overhaul shows that Electricity was there well before um, 1914, wasn't it? Um, and if they were overhauling it, it, it was, I would imagine, it was there at the turn of the century, if not before that, you know? So um, I still have to do some um, routing to try and find out when it was actually put in, because there has to be something in the um, estimates in that. Now, some of the um, difficulties encountered by Dublin Corporation in matching its conflicting obligations and draws and finance are shown in the minutes of the Market Committee in uh, 1894. In this report, seeking to obtain the authority of the Council to carry out necessary works to complete the undertaking of the food market, which it states is a credit to the municipality. A big change from uh, when it opened and they were saying it was an absolute disgrace the markets in the city. In placing the plans before you, the committee begged leave to say they're not unmindful of the conditions of things still existing in the vicinity of the Ormond market, a district which for misery, ruin and decay it would be hard to find a parallel. And further, it may be well to state that the committee are considering the references from the council relative to the housing of the working classes in the neighbourhood of the market and have been in communication with the Public Health Committee on the subject but no definite conclusion has yet been arrived at. We hope however soon to formulate a scheme which shall be dealt with a further special report. And constantly the condition in the Ormond market comes up and uh, I'm sure most of you know where, where it is but if you don't the best way of explaining it is that it's on the north side of the quays facing 
the civic offices and just in behind the buildings. There's a white new building there and there's a lane up between a pub and this building. Just up there, turn to your right, is Almond Market. And some of you will know where Johnny Giles was born. And um, it's a lovely little uh, square. The market proved so successful that within four years there was an extension built. This was reported in the Markets Committee minutes of 1895. There was a temporary market close by as the original structure couldn't cope with demand. Under the chairmanship of Councillor Philip Little, the contract for building was awarded to William Conley at a cost of £9,875. This was agreed and there were just three votes against. So obviously it would seem to me that the debate about where money should be spent was there. Um, the cost was £987, but the estimate that had been put aside for it was £8,000, which led to a shortfall of £1,875. But this was met by money left over from the original build. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to skip a bit of this. There's a mention in the same report of the customer sending vegetables to the market untrimmed and the cost that accrues from cleaning the market afterwards. There's also a mention of an initiative to encourage small stallholders by reducing the charge per cart from fourpence to threepence for gardeners and farmers. As a consequence of traffic being allowed in the market, forced it was the horse and cart, uh, and in a lot of cases push carts, leading eventually in years to come to motorised traffic as tra traders moved with the times. Difficulties can uh, ensue, as can be seen from a question put to the manager in 1960 by Councillor Paddy Cowan. To ask the city manager, is he aware of the continuous running of engines of tractors in the confined space of the food market on market mornings sets up a dangerous pollution of the air that is a menace to everyone employed or having business there, and if he will take immediate steps to end this dangerous menace to health. The reply was that um, the question of air pollution in the wholesale food market as a result of petrol and diesel fumes has been under consideration. Steps, however, have been taken to ensure that, as far as possible, engines are switched off when the vehicles are stationary. I've asked for a report of the matter generally for consideration. Presently, forklifts speed around this market, as you all know, and I recently heard a tourist refer to it as, it was like a ballet for them, for them. And when you think of it, that's, that's what it is. I haven't got much more, so I've finished. One of the first traders in the market when it opened was Kate Leonard, the great-grandmother of the Leonard family, who still trade there today. And Derek told me, Women were the main traders as their men folk walked in the brewery, both Guinness and Jemison, and spent most of their money on drink. <laughs> okay. Women earned their money to put food on the table. His grandmother was a stallholder at first and then moved into wholesale by procuring a bank. Banks, I told you, were, were the small areas, right? Now, um, Kate was followed into the business by three more generations of wholesalers, starting with John Leonard, Derek's grandfather, and then by his sons, Tom, Mick, and John, who was known in the market as Jackie to avoid mixing them up with his father. Jackie was the father of Derek, who now runs the family wholesale in the market. John Leonard's son, Tom, went into politics and was a councillor with Dublin Corporation while working in the market. He was elected as TD in 1977 general election, standing for Fianna Fáil in the Dublin 7 area, which includes the markets. And it's interesting, of recent years when I'm down there, it's the one area of the city where nobody hangs election posters, because it's cleared out at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, and there's nobody living in those streets. And when councillors and TDs don't hang up posters, you know there's some reason for it, you know. Uh, as the constituency was redrawn 
for the 1981 election, he lost the seat and he again failed in the February and November 82 elections. But following the death of George Colley in 1983, Tom won the by-election and again served as TD for the area. During this period, he was appointed to the New Ireland Forum by the then Taoiseach Charlie Hockey. Due to party wrangling and much controversy, he was not allowed to contest the 1987 election under the Fianna Fáil banner and he accepted the party's wishes. He continued as a councillor and worked in the market until he retired. He died in Blanchardstown in 2004. Derrick himself started with his father working full-time in 78 as a brester, having previously worked part-time as a nipper. Derrick tells me a brester loaded and unloaded carts and lorries. He was later presented with a pen and a receipt book and promoted to salesman. When speaking about Kate, he tells me there wasn't much fruit available in the markets, so wholesalers bought from allotments and orchards for their apples, conference pairs, and whatever fruit was for sale. A lot of the vegetables, like cabbage, Brussels sprouts, potatoes, turnips, were sold at close to a set price unless there was a shortage. And Derek tells me that when he started selling in 78, Irish carrots sold at £3 for two stone, and today you'll get them for five euro, which is practically the same price. Now, when there's no Irish carrots, he tells me, they're imported from France, Spain, and Portugal, and when they're short in Europe, they're brought in from China. He spoke of an unwritten law on the market which dictated that you never cheated on a fellow trader, you never poached a customer. If you cheated the market, you cheated yourself. There's a lady there still trading called Anna Lawler. She was born in the area and lived in 8 Mary's Abbey. She went to George's Hill School and used to pass through the markets every morning, lunchtime and evening, on the way to and from school. The children were welcomed by the traders and off, which who often gave them apples on the way to school for the lunch with no charge. Occasionally, um, when I was in there, I have seen this happen with the children and everything that they say still happens, not maybe to the same extent. When she made her communion in George's Hill School and her confirmation in Halston Street Church, she paraded through the market with all the other children. She remembers grapes and barrels lined with cork to protect the precious cargo. Her husband worked for Madden's Wholesale and during the 80s he purchased the bank in the market from Derek Cullen. She told me thousands would come in for the auctioneers, and an auctioneer named No Dunn auctioned the first strawberries of the year for Irish nurseries. Her husband mentioned that anybody could be an auctioneer. I've already told you that. Right? Characters, now just quickly go through that. There was a guy called Stephen Kennedy who cut his left hand with some potato work, and it left him slightly disabled. As a result of the accident, his hand was slightly cord, and when he was unloading and he finished unloading, it gave the impression that he was looking for a tip. <laughs> and occasionally people did give him a tip. Right? Then there was a boy outside selling uh, newspapers who was nicknamed Mrs. And uh, he got this name from, uh, he had a speech defect, and he, if any time he spoke, he went, <laughs> and so he got his name, and this is how sometimes that effect the point of it, you know. Paddy Masterson was called Teddy Boy because of his dress, and then Leslie O'Neill was called the barber because he was always ready to graft a few shillings. Uh, one of these ways was he cut the hair of anybody who wanted it in the market. <laughs> and Derek told me that they all smoked, drank, morning, noon, and night. <laughs> now, um, just a small little piece here. In speaking to present-day traders, there's a perception that most of the stock in the market came from Rush and the general area. And there's probably a lot of truth in this, as Rush has a no ideal climate for potatoes and other crops. But I spoke to a local social worker that some of you may know, Mervyn Ennis, who spoke of his father, Tom Ennis, who had a 40-acre farm, uh, or it was called a market <coughs> garden, down in Ballymount, 
if you know where TV3 is down to where Dockles used to be and all the way down to Galco, that was their land. Uh, Mervyn speak of a small farmer who barely scraped a living from the land while raising his family. His father, Tom, originally had a small farm in Crumlin until 1950, but sold it and moved up to Ballymount, where he farmed until 63. His father grew the brassica crops, cabbage, broccoli, sprouts, cauliflower, etc., spring cabbage, savoy, and a brand called Offingham Flower Cabbage. He'd arrive in the market at 5 a.m. So this is, you know, one of the things where I found out. But I've, I've other uh, corresponding um, proof of that. So he'd unload his crop and he'd return to the early house for right to see if his crop sold. An auctioneer got it bags on the bank where he left his crop for auction. He paid the women who would hoe a line of cabbage as well as puddling them. And if you don't know what puddling is, it's basically the plants, the cabbage, uh, a bit of rope tied around them and they were just put into water and soaked in, in, in a basin of water and that was called puddling and that was done, I remember my father doing it before he actually planted the cabbage. Uh, he paid hackers, farm hands, he'd bring in three loads a day and he'd come home maybe with a profit of one and sixpence. <laughs> If the crop went unsold, it flagged down very quickly and was useless, except for feeding pigs. This crop was pulled by a horse called marmalade. <laughs> and he joked with Mervyn that all the horse ate was bread and marmalade. <laughs> he also grew lettuce and rhubarb, which gave a number of growths from March onwards. Mer Mer Mervyn has memories at the age of nine playing cowboys and Indians around the banks and sometimes running into the daisy market which was sited beside the food market on the Capel Street side. He remembers the dealers wearing shawls to keep warm at the market, as the market was very cold, which was a feature of its design, a precursor to refrigeration. The connection of the family didn't end there, as his brother Martin, on turning 14, went to work for Irish nurseries on Cromwell's for Road, uh, and they owned banks in the market, as well as employing auctioneers. My own personal memory of um, the Irish nurseries down there was when I moved to Talla, I, um, I bought some of the leftover fertilizer that they sold and spread it over my garden. And we had mushrooms grown there for many, many years. His father eventually contracted TB and ended up with the bank for closing. I'm just going to finish up with this small thing. Mervyn wrote, I thought, a lovely poem about his father, and um, it's published in, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Tala Sounding books that the Virginia House writers um, published. They've just done the, the third one here last week, but this is in the first one, and it's called My Father. I am still reminded of him in the smell of new mown hay, of fresh ploughed earth, bovril brown. I expect to see him when I visit Dublin City Market and amble about the banks of fresh vegetables, flour and fruit. <coughs> Sometimes I wait for the leathery faced dealers to inquire, are you the yellow man's son? Now the yellow man was the complexion that he had. So I leave it at that if it's okay to you. I'm sure you'll be happy. <laughs> Are there any questions? Or... Just wondering the early houses, how much connected with them with the market are they? Uh, the, the market was very important. Um, I mean, the, there were early houses all over Dublin, but in that particular case, um, the, <coughs> I mean, it, it was specifically, the early houses were specifically there for that, you know? Like, that would have been the big business in the area. I mean, there were some down the docks, there were some along the quays, but it would be the amount of people travelling in and out. I heard, I spoke to um, a man out from Bath when I, I gave the talk out there, and he was telling me about some of the traders coming in from Rush used to come through Drumcondra. And you'll all know the Cat and Cage uh, pub, was famous with John O'Casey connection. And they would be stopped there by guys who would insist on bringing their carts and trucks the rest of the way. They would get paid for this, you know. Now this seemingly happened at 
cattle market around the country as well. But to bypass that, they start coming down through Plum Tark and into the market that way, you know. But they either drank in the cat and cage early in the morning or they drank around the um, around the, the food market, you know. But it, it was an, an essential part of it, you know. Well, it wasn't all drink. There was suits as well. Sorry? There was suits there as well. Quite I'm sure about the travellers that were coming up. Yeah. Well, all of uh, all of the evidence that I've come across, and I suppose people only talk about sorrow, is that the problem of buying drink, not soup, created poverty for an awful lot of families, and led to women having to go out, as it says, as Derek says, to earn money for food on the table because the men spent all their money and even when in the 1960s when I went working in the gas company um, down along the caves there was still a lot of this poverty created the corporation as well the corporation and you know I mean I'm sure they did buy soup but drink was a big big problem and it had to, life was very tough you know we, we have life to be easy now with all our problems than people did years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make an excuse, but at the end of the day, it was the out, and women were the support for it, you know? And we, we have to understand it in its context. It's not a criticism of people, you know? And it would be foolish of us to try and criticise people in the past, because they did have a tough life. Sorry. Uh, uh, there's a point you made about houses in the area. <coughs> you were right in saying the houses were all knocked down. Yeah, yeah. So the people who were in, in those houses, where did they go? Um, a lot of the houses were empty. Oh, um, were derelict as... Derelict, yeah. as, as it said. But they were negotiated by a pure <coughs> compulsory purchase order. And um, Mr. Dudgeon, um, he negotiated these and people would have been paid to move out of the houses as um, would be still the case today, you know. Just a final, the, the, yeah. the prison, was the, pri the prison was obviously close to the houses. Um, well, I think the prison goes much, much further. further. The further houses further. would have been built on land when the prison, prison was called. Oh, right. yeah. But anybody that has an interest in um, Newgate Prison, it's a fascinating story. And I just, uh, I love telling stories. I'll just tell you a quick one. You've all seen the film The Great Escape. Yeah. Well, the real great escape or attempted escape happened in there, and it was women. And it's an exact, uh, the, the film is kind of a copy, I think, of this. It's too similar. Where, if you can take it, that a lot of this area was also covered by stalls with markets that were opened from Mary Zabby, uh, used to encourage markets in this area as well. And there were women in the prison, and they walked their way out with a broken spoon. They cut their way out underground, and what they did was they took the soil and they brought it in and they put it into the sewerage drains, similar to the film, right? And they were actually outside, under the stall, ready to come through when one of the women squelled them, and they were all caught, you know? And that was reported in papers all over Europe as the great escape. And it's so similar to the film that I'm sure somebody got, um, you know, inspiration there. But it's it's a fascinating area, and it's worth looking at if you get time to do a bit of research on. Is that how the pubs open so early? They still open early. Don't they still open early, um, and it's on the basis of these traders would have been in early and probably would have gone to bed early at night, you know, so where most people live their social life in the evening, their social life was tied to their work and would have been early in the morning, so, you know, there were, there were special exemptions for these pubs, but they were all over, anywhere where there was the docks, uh, anywhere where there was trade, on the south side as well, there were, you know, different markets, and uh, it wasn't just originally this market, um, there were a lot of other markets originally, and Moore Street wouldn't have been too far, you know. And one of the one of the interesting things I found is when the corporation walked at taking the traders or the sellers off the streets and bringing them in, they created another group of um, 
retailers who bought the stuff there and went there and sold the stuff in the street, still not paying licenses or, or that like that. I don't know. Is there, and, is there a list of those? Sorry? Is there a list available of the market growers that were involved in early days of the market? Um, I haven't found it, um, but a lot of the market, a lot of the traders that are still there, um, probably half of them are there from the beginning. And I can't believe, I've tried to get stuff from Dublin Corporation available, but they tell me they haven't got it. And I'm sure it's lying somewhere that just nobody knows. But certainly, there's nothing written down that I can find. But that doesn't mean it's not there, you know. Um, there has to be, everything in the corporation is recorded. And if they paid rent, it's stored somewhere, you know. It's just finding it. And uh, I mean, even getting what I have there has been a long trial of many, many hours in, in libraries and going through, getting leery or looking at newspapers and different things. But I'm sure if I kept at it for the next 10 years, I'd start finding all this stuff, you know. But nobody helps you with it, you know. Sorry. In the days of what happened to that? It closed down. It's still, the space is still there. Yeah. Um, if you go back, um, I don't know whether, whether you, you know where the Daisy Market is, but I'll show you. Oh, what's the one on Francis Street? I thought that was the Daisy Market. No, no, no. Ivy. Yeah, that's the Ivy. Oh, that's the Ivy. That's the Ivy. This is the side of the market where the fish market. If you go to the other side, um, the exact opposite end to this, there's a wall and there's a big gate, and if you can get in the gate, that's where the Daisy Market was. It's still left, but they've a whole load of bricks and stuff and builders' materials stored in there, you know. You can get into it from the market, um, but you have to wait till somebody leaves one of the doors open and slip out, you know, which is what I've done a few times. But it, it, the space is still there. They, they had a cafe in there as well, didn't they? And that was a very good place for food. Yeah. And it, it's closed now, hasn't it? Uh, well, it closed about 12 years ago. Yeah. And um, it's badly missed and was. But again, it, as the market was going, they weren't doing trade, you know. Um, there is plans for some sort of a, a restaurant in there. But the, the, the big mistakes I think, they're, they're talking about high-end everything in here, you know? And markets are not about high-end, they're about bargains and deals. Mm -hmm. And again, you'll just see it won't work if they, if they go down that road. I mean, it's really about, markets are about getting a bargain, whether you like it or not. Why does it call it Daisy Market? The Daisy Market? Why does it call it Daisy I have a lot to do. You know, I'm thinking at some stage, the was in there as well. It's quite possible um, because the there was flowers sold in this market, but it, it just became uh, too much for it, and stuff moved out. And but there was a whole load of it. was also called the chicken market, and it was called a whole load of other names. Where was the residence? Where was the residence? The residence. The I'll tell you is, you see, um, if, you, if you actually look at this down, at, sorry, this end of it. And if you just go in there, there's a few buildings which are now used to store. But, but the residence was just there. And right behind that was the Daisy Market. Most of the flowers come in from Chapel, is it? Sorry? Most of the flowers come in from Chapel, is it? Is that so, yeah. Yeah. yeah? And the way they used to bring them in was on their bikes. So the, you have Fladdy Olin. How would you bring Fladdy Olin in on a bike? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you, it's interesting you say that because there was also a steady stream of people who brought in vegetables and fruit that they grew in their garden on bikes, mm -hmm. and they were bought and sold in there as well. You yeah, know? But if, I got back to my area in that, yeah. and they were brought in in suitcases. Were they? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they put them in the suitcases yeah. and carried them on the front of the <laughs> Where there's a problem, there's a solution, isn't there? Yeah. 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 So are we is all it, okay? Is it fully occupied now? Or? I wouldn't say fully occupied. There, there, it is occupied, but it's not fully occupied. No. Half, half. half of it all the time is undergoing mm -hmm. renovation. So they've moved a lot of people out, you know. 
and come to arrangement with them. Yeah. Well, it, it's a place I do recommend people go in and have a look at it. It's a fascinating place. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, they're not closing it down. No, 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 no. The, the pension is to split it in half. And one side will be wholesale and the other side will be retail. Um, the plan was that you could actually see through the wall between them and you could still see the forklifts going up and down, but um, people wouldn't be allowed to go through the, the wholesale in the way they are now. You but know? you could always buy something retail there, couldn't you? Oh, you can, yeah. Yeah, oh, you can. yeah. yeah. still go in. Yeah. Still go in. Yeah. 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 I guess boards are yeah. there. Yeah, you can. Not, not from all the traders, no. but there are traders. The likes of Anna Lawler there now. She, yeah. She'd send you a few apples. The shows. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, that's her yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But well, going back to the pubs, how did that dip the nerves? Because if you remember, and I remember, they closed the half too. When the market was finishing up. Oh no, the market closed. It was the Holy Ghost. Yeah. They closed. The yeah. And um, the market now is closed by one o'clock every day. But I think in those days, um, most of the stuff would have been sold quite early. But they would have been getting ready and cleaning up for the whole lot. You know? But it was closed there every day in that stage. Yeah. See, they rec I always reckon the whole year was brought in to get lads out of the pub and get them home. Yeah. You know, yeah, they, 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 they were to clear them out like this. So, and also to rotate the pub staff, because the pub staff needed yeah. a break as well. But all they did in some cases was they locked them in. <laughs> oh, like that happened to them. <laughs> okay. Actually, there's no fun drinking in the pub now because I have to for it. Because most of them are now having to Yeah, yeah. All the fun is gone. Thanks very much, John. No problem. I really I enjoyed that. Thank you. I'll most certainly pay a visit before the Christmas, take a stroll through yeah, yeah. and see what's yeah. happening inside there. Just don't forget, folks, donation box at the back of the hall. List there for anybody that wants to put their name down that they might be interested in participating in this uh, crowdfunding for our uh, 1916 centenary event, uh, which is the working title of Norse, but I assume that's going to change, or otherwise people I think it's a bit of a carry-on or something like that. <laughs> I expect to see James to appear or something. Can, but, uh, I, can, I, uh, can I say something to you about that? Oh, I hadn't that. intended to do this, but I'll use it as an advertisement. Um, the, I, I mentioned the, the, the Tala sounding books, last week. and this was released, this was published last week. Um, they're in sale here in the library. Um, for a, for a tenor of anybody is interested in them, but they make all Christmas present. But what I was just thinking of doing was, if I give that to you, and if you can sell it to somebody for a tenor, and you can put it into that fund. Yeah. Thanks very much, okay. John. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, then would you, um, would you then do it? Sign them. Yes, sign them. Oh, for God's sake, I love signing them. <laughs> and that way, if I, if, if I take the sniper rifle out of the back of my car, yeah. <laughs> Managed to have a good crack at you on the way home there, and all this book will greatly retrieve, greatly right, yeah. increase in its value. Would you do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.